The United States continuously has open economic relationships with Latin America, especially to countries south of its border, immediately in Central America, in the Caribbean. Why did these countries not do better if open economic access was supposed to be so wonderful for their future? You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. Western imperialism has fundamentally shaped the developing world. In particular, Great Britain and the United States, the dominant capitalist powers of the 19th and 20th centuries respectively, have played a major role in this historical process. But why did they pursue imperialism? And what effects did such imperial practices have on the developing world? These are the key questions that my guest examines in his brilliant new book, Imperialism and the Developing World, How Britain and the U.S. Shaped the Global Periphery. In this fantastic book published last year by Oxford University Press, Atul Kohli meticulously examines both the causes and the consequences of modern imperialism. He finds that the impact of imperialism on the developing world has been primarily negative. Indeed, the key argument in the book is that there is an inverse relationship between imperialism and development. That is, the less control a state has over its own affairs, the less likely it is that the people of that state will experience steady and inclusive economic progress. Atul Kohli is the David K. E. Bruce Professor of International Affairs at Princeton University, and one of the world's leading experts in comparative political economy with a focus on developing countries. In this episode, Atul and I discuss whether imperialism is synonymous with colonialism, why powerful states imperialize, the varieties of colonization strategies, the importance of sovereignty in the pursuit of development, and the impact of China's rise on the future of imperialism. I hope you enjoy our conversation. It is such a pleasure to see you again and to have you on the show, Atul. Welcome. Thank you for your interest and thank you for having me. Well, I am, uh, or I have been extremely fortunate, Atul, to be one of your many students over two decades ago. And, you know, you've been a major inspiration to me, as you have to many others all over the world. Your numerous books, articles, they've all been extremely influential in the development discourse. And so, first of all, congrats on this latest book, Imperialism and the Developing World. I found it unputdownable. Let's begin with a few conceptual issues, Atul. The first relates to your understanding of the term development. And and I'm asking you this because I can vividly recall in one of your classes that I attended, you define development as a deliberate movement of societies towards a situation of more livable life conditions. I remember that phrase. And you also identified three critical elements of such livable conditions. And these were economic growth, some redistribution of that growth. And you also highlighted the importance of democracy for the distribution, the redistribution of the benefits of growth. So development, as you put it then, and I'm talking about two and a half decades ago, perhaps, was a process where all of these goals were to be maximized, even though there may be trade-offs in the process. So let me begin by asking you, do you still subscribe to that understanding of development? Thank you for your kind words about my scholarship, Dan. 
And as to the book at hand, as well as the early notes you have kept, thank you for keeping those notes. I still use that definition when I'm teaching courses on development. In the book you're, you, uh, that we're going to talk about on imperialism, I implicitly have the same view, but I emphasize the economic growth and industrialization process more as a benchmark for understanding whether countries are moving towards development or not. And distribution and democracy are in the background. And in some such cases, as in Chile in the book, where democracy was thwarted, I clearly view it as an anti-developmental intervention from outside. So in that sense, yes, I could continue to hold on to that definition with the, the triple elements you outlined, but more often than not in the current study, I focus on industrialization as a benchmark. Right, so in this latest book, Atul, you address both imperialism and colonialism. And you do so in terms of analyzing how Britain and the U.S. shaped the global periphery. And what I particularly liked is also your distinction between several types of imperialism. Most importantly, you talk about formal and informal empires. So let me again continue on this kind of line of questioning about definitions. How do you actually understand imperialism, which many consider to be a controversial term? And I'm asking you this because some would say imperialism is synonymous with colonialism. Is, the, is that your view? It doesn't look like it, at least in terms of what I read in the book. And so the question is, in what ways are they distinct if they're not similar? And is imperialism, as I understand it in the book, more of an overarching concept where colonialism is a subset? Yes, that's exactly right. You read it right, Dan. Uh, and I would expect nothing less from you. Uh, imperialism, I understand almost in a commonsensical dictionary meaning of that term. It is an effort by one state to control the political and economic fate of another state or people. That effort to establish control uh, or significant influence, of course, can be most readily had if you control their territory and government directly, which then becomes definition and understanding of colonialism, which is one form of imperialism. But it would be far too narrow an understanding of imperialism to equate it to colonialism. There are numerous cases in both in British uh, imperial history and then in the modern period in American efforts to establish an empire where territorial control uh, and direct control of a government of another people was not deemed necessary to establish significant influence uh, on matters uh, that were consequential for the interests of metropolitan powers. And this set of influence without territorial control, I call informal empire, which is a term I take from Gallagher and Robinson and many others have used it, though it remains rather controversial. And so a fair amount of attention is devoted in the book to uh, the issue of spread of informal empire. But as definition is concerned, imperialism is indeed an umbrella concept, which uh, includes both colonialism and informal empire. What I found fascinating is how well-structured the book is and, and also the main argument, just the way you, I mean, this is just exemplary a tool in terms of coming up with a set of questions and then summing up towards the end of each chapter and maintaining that red thread throughout, which in many ways is that Western imperialism has fundamentally shaped the developing world. And while imperialism has benefited the US and, and Britain, it has mainly had negative effects uh, and impacts in developing countries. And I really liked your argument, which I found very persuasive, that the loss of sovereignty, as you argue, has been the biggest casualty, right? In fundamental ways that have hurt the life chances of millions of people, and not just in Asia, but also Middle East, Africa, Latin America, 
So if you can, for my listeners, please explain this core argument of yours in the book that national sovereignty is an economic asset and how and why sovereignty is a necessary precondition for effective states. Yes, you know, that is the core argument, which you very nicely summarized. And since it took about 600 pages to develop it, I, I, can, I can only say a few words about it, but thank you for drawing my sort of drawing me into the heart of the matter. So in this modern day and age where globalization sort of became a mantra as if the more integrated developing world would become with the global economy, the better off they would be. I felt a strong need to look at the historical examples, which sort of spoke to, you know, if not the opposite, certainly told a cautionary tale that every time sovereignty of developing countries was deliberately undermined by Western powers, the impact was hardly benign. So if globalization was supposed to be so wonderful, how come when Britain colonizes India and maintains open economic relationships, why doesn't do India well? Mm. Why, don't sub why doesn't sub-Saharan Africa do well? The United States continuously has open economic relationships with Latin America, especially to countries south of its border immediately in Central America, in the Caribbean. Why did these countries not do better? if open economic access was supposed to be so wonderful for their future. So that led me into exploring historical examples. And instead of just making a blunt argument that colonialism is not good for the developing world, which has been made numerous, numerous times, I hardly needed to spend 10 years and write 600 pages on that theme. The issue was to see sort of the importance of sovereignty for economic development in various nuances. And so I was drawn to the idea that degrees of sovereignty matter in terms of economic outcomes. And so colonialism, I ended up arguing, tends to be worse for economic outcomes, whereas some intermediate situation of informal empire does allow some degree of growth but without distribution, without diversification, and without often without democracy. And in that sense, it's not to be, not to be ignored, not to be sort of uh, treated as of trifle value, but nevertheless, informal empire gave some be benefits to developing countries that colonialism did not, but less so than full sovereignty. And then I'm led to examine towards the end of the book that countries that become truly sovereign such as China and India in the modern day period do much better at development than semi-sovereign countries of Latin America, especially during the days of Washington consensus, but when United States reestablished influence to impose economic policies on Latin America to ensure that American banks got paid back. So that's the type of argument about importance of economic sovereignty and how it can be leveraged for effective development. And I more or less treat sovereignty as precondition for the development of effective states. In this book, I don't talk as much about the conditions for emergence of effective states. That's the earlier book I wrote on state-directed development. And so in a sense, the two books can be read as two volumes, this one emphasizing sovereignty and the earlier book emphasizing conditions under which effective states emerge. Indeed, because I was thinking we could... Um introduce that 2004 book slightly later into the conversation, Atul. In this new book, there are two major questions that you tackle. One, of course, is why powerful states imperialize. That's the first. And then the impact of such imperialism in developing countries. So let's begin first with the motivations of imperialists. And some would say, that it isn't just economic interest, right? And you've referred to this literature in the book that there may be all kinds of other motivations, political pressures within the country or maintaining political stability or some stable global order, trying to help citizens in distant countries to rise up against autocratic leaders, uh, promoting democracy, 
Some would say that, you know, these imperialists have nation building as, as being one of the crucial functions. Others would say outsiders can't build nations, all of that. But you argue that it is mainly the national economic interest that motivates these imperialists. Why is that the case, Atul? And is the evidence very clear cut? So in many ways, I'm trying to understand how do you think both Britain and the U.S. have justified, legitimized imperialism? Well, you know, that last question would take us in a slightly different direction in terms of Mm -hmm. the legitimacy issue and different ideologies in different centuries. But let me get back to the core question you raise, which is how strong is the evidence and why do I choose to emphasize national economic interest as the motive driving imperialism uh, in juxtaposition to variety of arguments that have been put forward. So as you know, as most of the readers to this, uh, listeners to this podcast will know, the debates on why imperialists imperializes is legion. And I am arguing against both pretty narrow Marxist arguments as well as realist arguments. And that is to say that I am arguing imperialism is not only moved by uh, the economic interests of metropolitan capitalists, and I'm arguing you cannot reduce imperialism mainly as a security motive. Instead, governments are the key actors in the act of imperialism. It's governments that imperialize and it's governments that are subjugated. So imperialism in the end is very much a political uh, process. And in that sense, you have to explain why governments choose to imperialize. And unless you buy the Marxist argument that governments of advanced capitalist countries are no, no more than just executive committee of the bourgeoisie, an argument I don't buy, you have to then understand what is it that motivates sort of say British and American governments to go out and consistently sort of intervene in the developing world. And the evidence I sort of found reasonably strong, though it's not without holes, is more often than not these governments thought their countries would benefit from access to these peripheral markets. And in that process, of course, they're taking account of the interests of metropolitan capitalists, but it's a broader understanding of national interest, sort of in the sense of economic interest and of economic. Strong economies also mean powerful states. So in that sense, economic motive is at the same time uh, a political uh, motivation. And that's why I use the term national economic interest. And the argument is, I think, pretty strong in about two thirds of the cases I analyze and not as strong in about a third of the cases. So in terms of the the last bit, and I know that was much more of a broad question about legitimizing imperialism, let's say in Britain, Atul, how was it that the elites legitimized these acts of imperialism, colonialism within their borders? Was it a clear-cut argument that colonialization is good for us, it's good for trade, you'll all benefit, and that's why we are conquering the world? Yes, world betterment has been the consistent theme in across Britain and United States. You know, so you can go back to 19th century British statesmen talking about their mo- main goal being world betterment, and then you can jump to Woodrow Wilson in the United States or late in the 20th century to Bush trying to help improve quote unquote the fate of Iraqi people. And so world betterment, whether that's understood as economic improvement due to free trade or bringing democracy or in earlier historical examples, bringing civilization to barbarians. So that has been a consistent theme Though, of course, that needs to be modified depending on the historical time period and who you are colonizing. So it would be much harder to say vis-a-vis China that in the 19th century during opium wars that you're bringing civilization. The Chinese were pretty civilized and they thought the British were the barbarians. So those things have to be modified according to place and time. But on the whole, the one consistent theme in 
the legitimizing uh, process has been that we are better than them and we hope to help them and improve and climb up the ladder of all that is good in civilization. Continuing on this theme, Atul, in many of my interactions, say particularly in India, and I'm sure you've had many of these discussions yourself over the years, but also in some parts of Africa, I've been told that there have been numerous positive benefits. And, and you touch upon this also in your book, that in terms of, say, creating political institutions, infrastructure, such as railways, and, and in a country like India, the English language being this binding force that binds all of these groups and regions together. Others often, uh, my students often have pointed to the introduction of liberal ideas and, and their role in addressing, say, women's empowerment or combating awful practices such as widow sacrifices, the sati, etc. So I'm just thinking, I mean, I, I, I'm in agreement with you that the, the role of imperialists and the impact has been mainly negative, but how do you think we should balance some of these positive socio-political effects with the overwhelmingly negative economic effects? Yeah, no, that's a good question, and it needs to be thought about. There is a sort of moral calculus involved there. How do you how do you assess costs and benefits? But think of it this way: if after two hundred years of colonial impact, nothing good was left behind, what sort of brutal rule would that have been? Hmm. So the fact that British are in India for 200 years and after that Indians speak English and have some railways, is that enough? You know, you can do that in 20 years. Japan and Korea in 50 years achieved enormous amount uh, of, you know, quote unquote, brutal development through repression, but also hot house like transformed those societies. So after 200 years, if there was nothing there to be appre appreciated, that would be enormously uh, damaging. So one can admit some good things colonialism left behind, and I don't, and, and I do it, it, agree with that, and I even mention it. But on the whole, the fact is when India becomes independent, the average age of life expectancy of an Indian is 30 years. And that has to be the final barometer of what the impact of rule was. I totally agree with that, uh, Atul. In fact, you do point out somewhere in the book, those figures, those development indicators are not very impressive. In fact, one of the most negative effects of British rule in India, something that I've studied, is of course famines. The total lack of responsibility and accountability of the colonial rulers. We're talking about millions of people who perished the only good thing that came out, I suppose, were the codification of so-called Indian famine codes, you know, a set of instructions to, to the bureaucrats as to what they should be looking out for, some sort of an early warning system. So obviously, I, you know, I totally agree with you that, that that has been negative. Of course, you mentioned famines, but I'm just thinking that would, that is also another very sort of persuasive case to use in this context in highlighting the major negative impacts that British colonialism had on India. Yes, no, I agree. Uh, I chose not to write more about famines. Uh, maybe I should have, but uh, I'm glad you have worked on that theme and AKSN and others have. So I did not focus on it, but yes, that is one way of looking at it. But coming back to sociopolitical, you know, possible uh, pluses against economic negatives. I think that ledger is much more specifically an Indian ledger. If you shift to Africa, even on socio-political side, the British legacy, for example, in the 19th century, uh, sorry, even in, in early 20th century, it is pretty negative. You know, they hardly leave behind good institutions. They they wish to uh, run African empire uh, on the cheap. And they hardly put effort into creating centralized armies or civil service, some things at least India got after 200 years. And so you end up in countries like Nigeria with highly fragmented states without centralized professional uh, apex. And worse, you get politicization of ethnicity along regional lines 
because during the colonial period, a central government was never created. So India in some ways did a little better after 200 years on the institutional side, but not on economic side. A country like Nigeria ends up with terrible institutions and deep economic underdevelopment after the colonial period. You examined, of course, some of these issues in the 2000 book, right? The state directed development, and especially because you focused on state building, if I remember. In this book, of course, you have this one chapter on the varieties of colonization and Indian and Nigeria, um, you know, you compare these two countries. So I wondered if you could reflect a bit more, Atul, on that comparison, on, you know, what, what distinguishes state building or the institution building in India and why it didn't take place in Nigeria. That's one set of issues. The other one, which I found very interesting, is, of course, that Britain gained economically far more from India, you write, than Nigeria. Are these two issues connected that, you know, maybe there's something about Britain being in India for a longer period or investing more in creating institutions, in, a, in creating a civil service because it was gaining so much more and not doing the same in Nigeria? Yes, I think the two are related. And it is also the case Britain come to Africa much later, it's only after the scramble for Africa in the late 19th century that the colonial impact on uh, large parts of Sub-Saharan Africa becomes evident. And by that time it was clear, now I take that back, it wasn't totally clear, there was still hope that Sub-Saharan Africa might reveal riches once the interior gets opened up. But for the most part, the British did not have high economic hopes for sub-Saharan Africa. There was some hope that, oh, maybe once railroads get developed, they will go inside and like South African mines, there will be mines in Western Africa, minerals to be discovered, maybe cotton production could be boosted. But on the whole, they did not expect enormous economic advantage from sub-Saharan Africa. So the scramble is as much political in the sense of keeping the French out as it is economic so as to get better goodies out of Africa. India, as you know, followed a very different trajectory. East India Company went to India to make riches and riches they made. And because Indian monarchs and landed classes had expropriated enormous amount of wealth of Indian peasants, there was a lot more land-based wealth to be had in India. And so revenue could be collected. And because revenue needed to be collected, a civil service was needed. And since this is 19th century, there is a need to sort of build a centralized army, not only to conquer India, but then to spread the em empire into the near abroad. So Indian Sikh soldiers are used for opium wars in China. A variety of other Indian soldiers are used to conquer to spread British empire uh, into Malaysia, Singapore, as well as towards the Middle East in the other direction. So there were military and economic needs that led to development of better institutions in 19th century India, a centralized army, as well as a civil service. By contrast, by the time British colonized Africa in 20th century, it is, the mindset has become that these colonies have to be run on the cheap. If there are economic benefits, great. Otherwise, Britain was not willing to spend much money. And since land wealth was minimal, taxation of it was minimal, very little effort went into building institutions that were a product of other interests, such as spreading empire or collecting revenues in the case of India. So what you end up with is you know, because of a 19th century earlier start and different set of interests, which are more or less mercantilist interests, pre-capitalist, India ends up with institutions, whereas sort of once capitalism is mature, the main interest for Africa is possibly trade and extraction of minerals. Uh, other than that, British has, Britain doesn't have deep interest in extracting land revenues in Africa. And as a result, variety of institutional developments follow. I found that chapter you have on the East India Company to be just wonderful reading. There's so much rich empirical material there, Atul. And also you mention in the book, the Royal Niger Company. And 
I'm just wondering in this case, and this is fascinating how you have these private sector entities expanding their operations in, in uh, distant lands, and then the British state taking over. So I'm wondering what you think characterized that relationship between the British state and, say, the East India Company or the Royal Niger Company? Because it appears to me after reading your book, and I remember from history lessons when I was a kid, that you know, the personal ambitions of some of the representatives of the company, say Lord Clive or Warren Hastings in India or George Goldie in Nigeria, they mattered a great deal, right? So was it the personal ambitions or innovative entrepreneurial leaders who laid the, the foundations and then the British state took over? But also during these interventions by these entrepreneurial individuals, the, the British state was still actively involved in supporting the company, wasn't it? Oh, yes. You know, these companies were a product of royal charters. So in that sense, British state has given them permission to be monopoly actors in these parts of the world. So there's a direct relationship. That was the nature of uh, original British spread of colonialism, you know, including ships and companies that went to Chesapeake Bay and established the empire in the Americas. Uh, so in that sense, sort of private companies leading, you know, whether it was Dutch East India Company or East India Company, or much later in a bizarre form, uh, United Fruit Company buying up land in Central America and then about to lose it. And then Britain, uh, then United States comes and intervenes in place like Guatemala, which is the cover of my book. Private companies leading and states being closely associated is one important strand of imperialism. It originates with Dutch East India Company, and we st still see some of it in the modern world when American government seeks to protect nationalization of American companies who got there first. I love the cover of the book, by the way. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I, I've, been, um, I've been promoting it on Twitter. Thank you. Moving on to, or actually returning to the distinction between formal and informal empires, Atul, why do imperialists choose to colonize some countries, such as Britain's colonization of India, Nigeria, while in other cases, Britain's actions in, say, Argentina, Egypt, and China, it's much more of an informal model or variant. So in some instances, there was the use of, say, brutal force while in other cases it wasn't used. And related to this is, of course, the impact on developing countries themselves. So the question is, does it matter to developing countries what type of imperialism they're exposed to? And, and is this somehow related to economic growth patterns that may perhaps differ in formal empires like India versus informal empires that the British had in Argentina? Yes, it matters greatly. And, you know, if you just look at even gross figures, Argentine economy does quite well under, under British informal imperial influence for much of the 19th century, include up into early part of 20th century, Argentine economy grows you know, moderately well as the turn of the century, as you would know at the turn of 20th century. Buenos Aires is as prosperous and sophisticated a city as is New York. But the fact that Argent Argentine economy never recovers post-1930 tells an earlier story, which is the type of economic development Argentina underwent under the informal conditions. And that is that they became a commodity producing economy run by uh, landowning interests of Argentina, which had very little interest in pushing a, a national project that might involve industrial transformation. So a country like India ends up neither with the benefit of commodity-led growth, that is in part because India's commodity exports never meshed well with British needs. So India ended up sort of being an exporter of opium to China and Chinese tea sold back in Britain. So Britain establishes a triangular trade with vis-a-vis -vis its Indian colony. It dumps manufacturing goods like textiles into India. 
doesn't buy that much from India. Indian opium goes to China and Chinese tea back to, back to Britain. And in the process, the economic growth of India is minimal. By contrast, Argentine exports are much in demand in Britain as well as elsewhere over time into the United States as well as other European countries. And so commodity led growth does get Argentina a lot further than India. And in that sense, by early 20th century, Argentina has some prospects of modernization, which don't come to fruition, mainly as a result of the ruling coalition favoring commodity dependence. And in that sense, they invite dependent development rather than push forward a more autonomous industrialization process which eventually Nehru in India and Mao in China were. We can go on and on about the role of Britain, but let's move on to the impact of the United States in the developing world, which is also an important part of your book. And one of the many conclusions, but I found this fascinating in the book, is what you conclude to be the U.S. preference for informal empires. You know, I would very much like you to reflect on why that was the case. Why, why doesn't the U.S. sort of choose or did not choose full-fledged colonies? Is it because they had different motives than, than the British? Uh, was it the kind of economic situation that the U.S., the power of the U.S. economy, unlike the British economy, which was dependent on, uh, on income from abroad? Was it different motives related to access to markets? I'm trying to you know, tease out some major differences between the British model of informal empires versus the American preference solely for informal empires. Yeah, that's a very important question, Dan. So thank you for focusing on it. The first thing to notice is I don't think it's fair to juxtapose British versus American in 19th and 20th, because a good chunk of what Britain is doing in 19th century is already informal empire. So the three parts of the world you mentioned, the Ottoman Empire, the Chinese Empire, and much of Latin America, Britain's mode of influence in these regions of the world Britain itself chooses not to colonize these. So you could ask the same question you're asking about US versus Britain. You could ask that in 19th century, sort of comparing India and China. I'm not going to do that because our time is short, but you could ask why does in the middle of 19th century, Britain chooses to establish crown rule in India after the mutiny, but after the opium war, chooses to establish his informal empire in China. So it's the same type of question, but let's focus more directly on the question you asked because the same question can be posed as to why United States on balance chose to avoid colonial uh, pattern and move towards informal empire. Well, you know, one simple answer is it's 20th century rather than 19th century. By now, self-determination is becoming a major issue Woodrow Wilson himself committed the United States to self-determination. U.S. was an anti-colonial country. And so in that sense, there was an ideological hesitation at a pretty deep level to acquire territories. If you look at uh, U.S. history and when they were acquiring Cuba, there was enormous debate in American Congress. And there was an amendment called the Teller Amendment, which had to be passed before the United States decided to go to war with Spain uh, in the late 19th century and Teller Amendment was essentially that US was not going to occupy Cuba. And then the quote unquote anti-imperialists got on board and war on Spain was declared. So as early as late 19th century, it well into the 20th century with the exception of Philippines, the United States really did not have the taste for colonies. However, they had a strong taste and there was near economic consensus in late 19th century that United States needed uh, external markets to help its own capitalist economy. So how to square this circle has been a persistent struggle uh, in 
American foreign policy making towards poor countries. And their solution was their own Philippine model, which was sort of, as they described it at, at that time, it would be an iron fist in a velvet glove. And that's equivalent of their sort of mantra of how informal empire will be conducted. That is, you will establish friendly regimes in the periphery and the friendly regimes will maintain order and they will open their economies. So having stable subservience is the common mechanism that both Britain and United States use to establish informal empire. And the United States has mastered that art much better than the British did. American economy was also much more capitalist by the time America becomes a great power compared to Britain in the 19th century. And in that sense, United States doesn't need territories. It has more territory than, than it needs by expanding its own land empire. So by the time the United States becomes uh, an overseas power, the fact that it's an anti-colonial country, the fact that self-determination is now on the global agenda, the fact that the United States doesn't need territory, what it needs is market, all of these factors combine to give United States uh, a preference that emerges through trial and error for informal empire over its Philippine model of more direct colonialism. Well, that's fascinating because that is also one of the common sort of red threads in the book about how important it has been for Britain and the US to have this kind of subservience, these uh, elites in these countries that have somehow given up or seen that their continued welfare is dependent on the actions of the imperialists. And I wonder whether that explains at all why the US perhaps wasn't interested in or could not get more influence and begin an informal empire, say in India, that they couldn't get that kind of subservience. Are you talking of the post-World War, post -World War II period? Yes. Yeah, no. In Asia, it has become very difficult to reestablish stable subservience as a result of emerging nationalist movements. That's true for Vietnam, where they fight and lose, and it's true for China and India and, and Indonesia. So there, that possibility does not exist, and there's a clear break in establish of nation building uh, in Asia as a result of nationalist movements. That is not the case in Latin America, where the stable subservience model is more applicable, and it is America's backyard, and that model is used much more in Latin America and to an extent in Middle East but it is not possible after in the post-World War II period, that option is not available in the, uh, East, uh, East Asia as much. There are a few countries, Philippines, it continues to an, extent, Korea, to an extent Korea and Taiwan, which are more Cold War cases, but nevertheless, some influence is possible, but there they have to deal with mobilized nationalism with big players like China, India, and Vietnam. But continuing on this post-World War II period, Atul, I was fascinated with all those numerous interventions you list in the book, American interventions. So you have the Philippines, you have Korea, you have uh, Laos, Cambodia, Guatemala, but you chose three cases, Iran, Vietnam, and Chile. Why did you choose these three countries and what, what are the distinctive features of these three cases at all? Well, you know, some cases had to be chosen, so I chose, <laughs> yeah, three of those, chose three of those. You know, I regret not having dis discussed Guatemala more because Iran and Guatemala happen around the same time and both are very instructive. But to answer your question, those three cases reflect three parts of the world in which the United States tried to establish influence. Uh, Middle East and Latin America with greater success and Asia with less success. So the three cases, Vietnam where they lose, uh, in, in Persia, in Iran, where it certainly forestalled democracy, and in Chile, which I think quietly many Americans still think was a successful intervention. Uh, those three cases not only reflect America's 
regional interests. They also reflect three strategies, somewhat different strategies of, of spreading influence, anywhere from hard militarism in the case of Vietnam to covert regime change, as in the case of uh, both Iran and Chile. And then on to, in the last part of the American intervention portion of the book, uh, imposition of Washington consensus in Latin America, which is a third form, third strategy of America's informal empire building, which is sort of multilat multilateral collaboration in this case through the IMF and World Bank. So these three stands, strands, direct regime change, multilateral collaboration and hard militarism have been part of the repertoire of mechanisms that United States has used to establish informal empire. And I thought the cases I chose at least demonstrated some of those tendencies. You know, when I think about it and having read your book recently or two, it seems to me, and I agree that you can't really compare perhaps like with like in terms of Britain and the US and the different time periods, but it seems to me, and I may be wrong, I'd like to hear your views on this, that the British gains from imperialism, from colonialism, appear to be much more important than, say, the ones resulting from US interventions. I'm thinking about Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, huge losses of lives on all sides. War is also very costly. And the US got stuck in many of these countries for a long time. So. I'm just thinking, you know, what, what did the U.S. get out of all of these interventions in the post-World War II period? What actually worked? Because when you, when you discuss the role of multilateral institutions and that kind of partnership, the IMF, the World Bank with the U.S. and the impact that that had in the U.S. backyard in Latin America, I see it to be mainly negative. There's this kind of anti-American feeling. So do you think something good came out of it? Obviously, some access to markets, but Politically, it wasn't that that good or successful, was it? Well, I think I would demur a little bit with mm -hmm. with uh, with the good sensibility you have put forward. I think costs and benefits have to be assessed in terms of how much effort goes into it. Of course, United States is a giant economy, and what does it get out of deposing an Allende? in Chile, right? You know, you can say it's 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 pitiful why they would do that, uh, considering how much negative uh, sort of view, uh, negative sort of publicity the United States got as a result of meddling in a thing. So could it be seen as economically advantages at all? But you have to keep in mind how little it cost them to do it in, in the sense of, the effort it went in, they had trained those generals ahead of time, and then they were threatened by sort of nationalization of copper uh, and nitrate industries. And most important, they didn't want that type of nationalist, social democratic type of model of development to spread to the rest of Latin America. And so US interventions have to be seen more in systemic terms. United States is setting boundaries on what is possible, desirable, and in that sense, benefits to them are much harder to measure. British benefits from India, I have tables and tables to document it and you can show advantages. It is much harder to do for a giant country like the United States to say it really benefited from intervening in, uh, in Chile. On the other hand, it certainly forestalled the possibility of social democracy spreading in Latin America. They drew the boundary that this is a boundary you will not cross. The same thing when they did the earlier coup in Iran, uh, they told the world that nationalization of oil will be costly. And it took another two decades before countries actually nationalized oil. So they forestalled what was might have been coming and inevitable. So in that sense, United States empire has to be understood more as a system-wide process, and the U.S. views its gains 
in systemic terms. And so you cannot think of them in sort of direct narrow sense of uh, was it worth having copper not nationalized in Chile against deposing a yende. That would be too narrow a cost benefit analysis. You have to think of it in systemic terms of what it gained in Latin America as a whole. Atul, a final set of overarching questions. And, and the first issue that I would like to discuss with you is in many ways the future of imperialism. And I've been studying China, China in Africa, India, China relations. And there is of course a lot of tension between the US and China. And some, some have been um, using this, the new scramble for African narrative to, to characterize Chinese and even Indian interest on the continent. One thing that I find fascinating, and I wonder whether, I didn't see it in the book, but I just would like to hear your thoughts on it, is why did the US consistently, and especially in the last few decades, why has it neglected Africa? China has been far superior in that sense in terms of building infrastructure, cultivating soft power, providing loans and, and grants, whereas you know America has just not been there. And even now, it's been some sort of a, a kind of a hesitancy to engage with the African continent. So in terms of the future of imperialism, I'd like you to reflect a bit on China and its ambitious uh, infrastructure project like the Belt and Road. And I mean, the US position sometimes is very anti-China, whereas I find in many parts of Africa, far more balanced, more positive understanding of China's role. So how do you see the future of imperialism involving countries like China? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. I speculate on it towards the end of the book, but uh, it is an emerging trend. So it was much harder to write about because the evidence wasn't clear cut. My concluding thoughts in the book were that what China's impact on sort of on its, in its uh, near abroad, as well as in Africa is more akin to creating dependency rather than spreading an informal empire. And the distinction is that these countries are becoming economically dependent on China, either through loans or through uh, depending on investments or, or markets. But at the same time, China has so far stayed away from use of coercion, which in my uh, thinking is pretty essential for ambitions, deliberate ambitions to establish, establish uh, informal empire. So I think so far, except maybe in a case like Sri Lanka, where China used the power of uh, economic, use, used its economic leverage to secure, to secure a port, that comes pretty close to looking like a traditional informal imperial action the United States might have taken. Short of that, China hasn't moved in that direction. Will it move in that direction? Yes, if they can get away with it. I think what keeps them back is they're not sure they can get away with it. They, they're still, you know, sort of operating from a position of somewhat military weakness when it comes to Africa. Yes, United States has neglected Africa, but it neglected it mainly because it left it to the British and the French to still continue their interest in that area. So Commonwealth and Francophone Africa have been sort of left to British and France, Britain and France. All right, if there's trouble, you take care, of, take care of it. If there are some economic advantages to be had, you take care of it. After all, after all you are our junior allies in the global condominium of powers. And in that sense, you can still have some uh, peripheral interest. U.S. has instead concentrated on greater riches of Latin America, oil in Middle East, and dynamic economies of East Asia, leaving Sub-Saharan Africa to old colonial masters. And in that vacuum, China has moved in. Will there be a new scramble for Africa? I doubt it, not in the old fashioned sense. On the other hand, this, as you're studying it, you know there are already competing ambitions for influence in Africa. I was intrigued that even Russia now wants to get in uh, into the game. And there are countries where there are both American and Chinese military bases in Djibouti, for example. 
quite an intriguing drama of uh, spread of influence. I suspect if African rulers are half decently clever, which they're likely to be, they may be able to diversify dependence and take advantage of this uh, competing imperial ambitions from outside. On that matter, Atul, I remember vividly you telling me a story about how you met many years ago Chief Obasanjo at an airport. I don't know if he was president then. And I'm just thinking about the kind of conversations you've had over the years with people like Obasanjo, who I also met actually a couple of years ago. I found him to be a fascinating character. But your kind of conversations with elites in Nigeria and other parts, how did they perceive imperialism, either from, from Britain or from the US? What was their take on it? Were they, were they willing to participate, but maybe they were not being asked to participate by the US? Well, I'll tell you a story about Cardoso, with whom I had first-hand discussions of these things mm -hmm. when we did a fresh shrift for, for Fernando Enrique Cardoso, the former president of Brazil. We did a fresh shrift for him in Brown, and I had a chance, was fortunate enough to have some discussions and present some of the materials uh, from this book in front of him. And so the chapter on Washington consensus, some version of it I presented, and in it I suggested that Asia embraced globalization with its head held high and Latin America embraced globalization on bended knees. And he smiled and he agreed, he nodded his head. He was sitting right there in front of the audience. And so we continued that conversation subsequently. And, you know, he, his, he could not talk as freely as, as uh, you know, he had been president of Brazil already. And so now he was a former president, but still his lips were not totally open. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was clear that there was anger in him, which I suspect was shared by some other Latin American leaders, the way Washington consensus was imposed on those countries. That I don't know if you recall this, Latin American leaders had tried to come up with an alternative to Washington consensus called the Cartagena consensus, which was would have prioritized growth over structural adjustment. And they lost that battle uh, because American demands were rather serious. And so in that sense, yes, uh, there was there is animosity. They see the reality. Cardoso more or less viewed the situation as I was viewing. I saw myself working in the same tradition as he had worked and he it was satisfying to see that he agreed with my analysis of the situation. On the other hand, if I was in his position, I'm not sure what I would have done different. You're living under constraints and so you acquiesce. One final question on India and Indian democracy. We both, of course, have studied India and you've written extensively on Indian democracy. And as you're aware now, in recent weeks, there's been quite a lot of focus on how India is not seen to be a dem uh, as a, a democracy by Freedom House and the VDEM uh, Democracy Project report. India's categorized as being partially free. How do you see Indian democracy today? And what are your thoughts on the future of Indian democracy, the role of Indian democratic institutions, and the, the capacity of these institutions to promote continued economic development? Yeah, I know I've been thinking a lot about that. You know, the problem has come home at a very personal level in the sense that my former student, Pratap Mehta, just had to resign from Ashoka University. Yes, so, that was very unfortunate. So I'm mobilizing at Princeton to try and get him a, you know, at least a temporary position for a year so he can breathe. Uh, so it's, it's, it's cutting home uh, very sharply the decline of liberal spaces in India. I do agree with outside criticism that India's democratic spaces are getting curtailed and I'm saddened by it, I get angry at it. What is troubling me as a scholar is I don't understand why there is a need for this. When I think back to the Indra Gandhi period in India, her power base was threatened. And there was almost, quote unquote, something rational about her authoritarian response in the sense that she needed to preserve her power to do so. That's and hence the emergency 
these guys are so powerful right now, their electoral, the, I'm talking of course about the BJP in power, is, you know, I don't understand why they need to sort of, sort of curtail liberal spaces in universities, you know, in some ways, they're riding a high wave. They can look good by allowing people to dissent a little bit. So it's a bit puzzling to me. I think some of it is ideological. Some of it is a reaction. When I read some more pro-BJP pro sort of commentary on what has happened, say, at Ashoka University, what you get is a sense that there is almost a jealousy of more anglicized Indians and their success in the world. They sort of want to bring down people like Pratap Mehta and, and Arvind Subramanian, which is totally bizarre because he was an advisor to the government. But it's sort of a sense that these are Ivy League connected Indians who are privileged and how dare they sort of demand any special political space. So I think there's an ideological component. There is some sort of lack of you know, enlightenment in part of BJP leaders. There is an authoritarian streak which has been there all the way back from origins of the RSS and Hindu nationalism. And some of that is there, but it remains from a, not from a political analyst point of view, there is something of a mystery until and unless you resort to the type of analysis I resorted to in my last book, that the underlying reasons are sort of the state and business compact. And in that, political spaces are narrowing because to continue to promote growth under conditions of growing inequality, you have to narrow the apex and turn it more authoritarian. So unless you go to that type of analysis, I remain a little puzzled why the BJP is doing what it is doing at present. As to the emerging future, I think my wishful thinking is that India is bigger than BJP, but I am afraid of the damage these folks are likely to do in the short run. Atul, you've been one of my heroes, and it has been such a great pleasure for me to speak to you today. Thank you so much for coming on my show. Thank you for your interest, Dan. Your questions were terrific. I wish you well. If you enjoyed this podcast, please spread the news among your friends and share it on social media. The Twitter handle for this podcast is Global Dev Pod. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.